Hi, welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Antonetti. And uh, we've been talking about for the last two parts, I believe this is the last part, hopefully, about graves of lust. And I know that many people may have never heard about it, but yes, in the Bible, in which, uh, you could look at Numbers chapter 11 and verse 35, that's where you will find it. And uh, we talked about why it's called the grave of lust, the graves of lust. And <clears throat> if you have not been listening for the last two segments, maybe you, know, you need to go back to graves of lust and look at the first one, the second one, and then you probably understand this one just a little better. But for the sake of moving on, we are looking at, into this graves of lust. We're looking into the word of Christ and why God called it that and what was going on. So, it tells us here in Numbers 11.35, and the people pulled up stakes from the graves of lust to Hazaroth and stayed at Hazaroth, which means the place of settlement. Now, when you look at the word graves of lust, it pretty much what it is what it is. Kabroth Atava. And what happened here was that the people, after coming out of the house of bondage, Egypt, they were brought to Mount Sinai by Moses' leadership. And there they receive the Ten Commandments. And there they receive the instruction. And the first commandment, of course, is I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the house of Egypt, the house of bondage. He brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other God before me. That is the first commandment. Those two are number one. That is the whole concept of the birth of Israel and those who are born again by the Spirit of God in Christ understand that it is the first commandment. There is only one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That means everything that you are. And so when they came out of Egypt, they stopped in between the place of Mount Sinai and Kadesh Barnea. Now, Mount Sinai, or Sinai means a thorn, a thorn. And this is where they received the law. The law is a thorn. It cuts. When we, when we shared yesterday about when they heard Peter's first sermon, they were cut to the heart. They were pricked like a thorn hitting them. And they said, what must we do to, to get saved, to be saved? And then they were supposed to go to, they were on their way to Kadesh Barnea, which means sanctification. So notice there's the word of God. And then there, there is the set apart of an individual to be, or individuals to be for God's holiness. Did you know that Jesus also set himself apart? In his great priestly prayer in the Gospel of John, he said, I sanctify myself, that they too may be sanctified. Now let me say something about the word sanctification because it's important. Uh, sanctification does not necessarily mean to be set aside from sin. Because we know that Christ did not sin, and he said, I sanctify myself. But it is a word to be sanctified, to be set apart for the work of God, for the glory of God, to be set aside to do the work of God. And so he said, I set myself aside to do the work. And the work that he was about to finish was the crucifixion. He was about to undergo the crucifixion and then resurrect from the grave, and then be seated at the right hand of God the Father. I remember that the Bible tells us that he is the, the exact image of the invisible God, and that he is the firstborn of every creature, every creation, let's put it that way, every creation rather. And it says that, um, that he... By him all things were created, whether they be visible or invisible. And it says, 
whether they be thrones and dominions, principalities and powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things consist, all things hold together. And so he's the head of all creation. And so here they stop in between Kadesh Barnea coming from Mount Sinai. And here the Bible says there was a multitude of people that was with them in the midst of them. And they enticed Israel with their cry to want more of what they left behind from Egypt. They came out of the house of bondage, but they wanted the food that was in the house of bondage. And sometimes you'd be surprised how many people will sacrifice their life and go back to what they were just to get a little of what they had. And so you have to be careful that you put yourself in that position. So here we are now as we're moving on because that place, the judgment of God fell upon them. Remember that he sent them quail. They, they wanted flesh. They, they started crying out, we want flesh. And they asked Moses, give us flesh. And folks, that's what happens when we, when we feel that God is not enough, that the manna that he was giving them is not enough. They started crying out for the flesh of Egypt. Hmm. We want the flesh of Egypt, the stuff we used to eat. We're tired of this, what they call it, manna. As a matter of fact, manna means, what is it? That's what manna means. What is it? It was a strange type of bread that came down from heaven. It had a beautiful color. And it tastes good. Sweet as honey. We should be satisfied with the honey of God's word. Period. Don't let any question enter into your mind that will dissipate the commands of God. The word of God is the law of God. You can look at this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 and 21. It talks about how God inspired by the Holy Spirit people to speak the word of God and to prophesy. And those words were written down. So every word of God is the source of who he is. He is truth. The Bible tells us all Scripture was God breathing, and it is profitable for doctrine, for rebuke, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man or the woman of God will be thoroughly furnished, perfect, and ready to do any work that God puts into your hand. So we are also the craftsmanship of Christ. We are the workmanship of Christ in God. And he and he craft us he put us together he weaves us together in our mother's womb so that we can do the purposes of God so you are a weaved creation of God perfectly weaved held together by the power of God and they they hunger for flesh and God gave them exactly what they wanted let me give you exactly what you are hungering for and the Bible says that he sent quail there was so much quail that they were on top of each other, according to what they say, it says that it was two cubics. Now, a cubic is about 18 feet, um, excuse me, 18 inches. From the elbow to the hand is a cubic. So it's about 36 inches, a little bit over a yard. They were on top of each other, and it surrounded the camp of Israel. And boy, when they saw that, they started collecting quail and eating it. And they ate so much. They ate so much quail that the Bible says it was coming out of their teeth and even their nostrils. And while they were eating it, the judgment of God fell upon them. See, sometimes you think something is good in your life. And while you're enjoying it, and God says, I told you I didn't want to give it to you, but you hunger for that. Here, take it. And while you're enjoying it, the wrath of God. Well, let me just say this first. We're not children of wrath. I would say the judgment of God. So I'm going to correct that. The judgment of God will fall upon us. That will, that will teach us not to hunger for the things of this world. The Bible, says it, the Bible tells us that it, whoever loves the things of this world, whoever loves the things of this world, the love of God is not in them. Whoever loves this world, the love of the Father is not in them. So if we love the things of this world, 
we're not going to be satisfied because the world cannot satisfy us. See, we have an eternal spirit. And so therefore, the eternal spirit is the only, the only one that can satisfy our cravings, our desires. Let not the world, neither the things of the world, satisfy you. For man loves the world, the Bible says, the love of the Father is not in him or her. For all that is in the world, the lust, the lust, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world and its desires will pass away. The world and its lust will pass away. But he who does the will of God will abide forever. And so understand, it was the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh that they were desiring. And it was really the pride of their life. And because of this, God resists them because the Bible tells us that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So now Jesus, of course, he, the Bible tells us that he is the bread of life and he came down from heaven. And let me tell you, only Jesus can satisfy. There's no one else, you know, no one else who can satisfy. And he fed some people. Yeah, fed a few thousand, a few times. A particular time he gave them bread. Oh, and I tell you, that bread that he gave to them, when he blessed it, it was good. It was like coming down from heaven. And when they found Jesus after, because he left, he left them, went to the other side of the sea. When they found him, they said, Rabbi, you know, how did you get here? How did you get here? <laughs> well, we know how he got there. He took a boat. <laughs> but nonetheless, he was on the other side. And he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, truly, truly. He says, you're seeking me not because you saw miracles, but because you ate of the loaves and you were filled. They were looking for another filling. And he told them not to work for that which perishes, but to desire the everlasting truth. Don't labor for meat that perish, but for the meat that endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him have God the Father sealed. Notice that the truth of God is what seals us to the heart of God. You can't know the will of God if you don't know the word of God was talking to a young man this week and um it was a it was a it was from a prior conversation that we had and I'm speaking to him about the importance of becoming a disciple. He's a young man. And um we talked and talked and I kept the word. You need the word. The word, the word, the word, the word, the word, the word, the word. And um there was in front of me some some literature that we use for Sunday school to train people about the foundation of the Word of God. And it was nice, loose leaf. It had a lot of information in it. And I handed it to him. I said, here, take this. You know, it's a foundation. It helps you. And we started talking some more. And I said, um, it came to the point that we started talking about the principles of God's Word. I said, well, you have, you have things there in that book. I said, do you want it? And he kind of smiled, you know, smirked took it, you know, and said, well, you know, I, 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 I'd rather just listen to God. And at this point, I said, I'm through. Because you're telling me that you want to listen to God, a voice in your head, but you don't want to know the word of God. I gave him homework prior to this to do. And it was simple instruction, what the Bible is all about. At least know what the Bible is about. One preacher said it this way, he says, you want to be a good preacher? Just know the story, know how to tell the story. Okay, fine. And so he didn't want that. And prior to this, he came out of a place where he needed, you know, help. And he needs to be discipled. And he would rather walk listening to a voice of his flesh, the world, the enemy, and what he thinks is God. And he's only going to fall by the wayside again. And this time it's going to be worse. But he said, don't, don't work for... Don't work. Don't labor for meat that perish. And then he said to them, you know, what, what shall you do? What, you know, excuse me. They said, what, well, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Well, there's only one work we can work, and that is to believe 
to believe. And that's what he says. This is the work of God, that you believe on him who sent me. But we know that faith is the only thing that can please God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And he gives examples in chapter 11 of Hebrews of all the people that lived by faith. And they suffered for faith. And that's the other part of this whole concept in the world is that, oh, well, God wants you to be rich. He wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to have this. He wants you. Um, folks, the judgment of God is going to hit this world and we're going to lose everything we have. The only thing that's going to stand is our faith, our work, and understanding that he is God. And if you're not ready to deal with that, because it can be lost at any time. And Jesus says, stop working for things that perish. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a house. And I'm listening that you shouldn't have a nice car. No, of course not. If God gives it to you, enjoy it. But don't work for that as though it is God for you. Don't do that. You're going to be messed up. How can we live except by faith? Brother Craig Allen is on line right now. He said, the just shall live by faith. Yes, Christopher, I'm looking. Faith, hallelujah. Craig Smith, seal. Kathy Jar, hallelujah. Wow, come on. I'm with you. And so I thank you also for the encouragement. So understand that here they go. They were really really in a tight spot. And look what happened in between the place of Mount Sinai where they received the word of God. Watch this. And they were, go, they were supposed to go to Kadesh Barnea to be sanctified, a multitude of people that were mixed in with them begin to complain about the manner that God was giving them. You know, it should never come out the mouth of a Christian I'm tired of this. I'm tired of the same word all the time. There's got to be other information out there. Yeah, there's a lot of information. But never get tired of the word of God. Oh, my Lord. I want to die with the word of God on, on my lips. I want to die quoting scripture. I want to die worshiping him. I've seen the saints that go to him and that are worshiping. I just, I just lost a good, a good friend of mine, a pastor, Danny Aviles. Oh, man, he worshiped God. He sang songs. He did everything that he had to do to make sure his mind was in Christ. And I got a call one day on a, on a I believe it was after Mother's Day. I, I don't remember exact day, but it was a few weeks ago. So let me just say that. He, he just went in his sleep. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, how good it is to sleep in Christ when you, when you go to that place of the grave and your body is sleeping and your spirit is with him and you're waiting for him, with him to come back. Oh, man. Stop working for the food that has no value in it. The faith of Christ is the only thing that we have in the word of God to give us significance. That boy gave me the book back and said, I'll, I'll, I'll just listen to God. And and that book was precious, precious principles that if he just read it and studied it, he would have some meat substance in his spirit and in his soul. And our fathers did eat of the manna of the desert. That's what, hey, he ate it. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. <clears throat> As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They, now, they, now they're quoting the Bible. <clears throat> now they're quoting the Old Testament. They said, hey, Come on, God gave us real manna. And Jesus declares something that is absolutely phenomenal. He says, hey, truly, truly, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. Wow. And they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. And he that believes on me shall never thirst. 
Behold, I say to you that you have seen me and believe not. All that the Father gave unto me, all that the Father gave me shall come to me. And him that comes to me, I will know wise cast out. Now, I want to share this last part of it, which is very important. <clears throat> How important is that we should listen to the word of God, and especially when we're in between journeys, is when the multitude shall rise up among you and try to create division and disbelief and doubt so that you can turn away from the word of God. There's only one person I know who likes to do that, and that is the enemy. He did that to Eve. He put a question mark in her mind where there should have been just a period. Did God say, yes, he said it, and that's, that's it. It doesn't matter. He said it. That's what it is. Now, these are the commands, the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded you to teach, to teach you that you might do them in the land wherever you go to possess it. That you might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you. You and your sons and your sons' sons all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. Hear, O Israel. Hear, therefore, Israel, and observe to do it, that it might be well with you, and that you may increase mightily. <laughs> they, didn't have to, they didn't have to hunger. All they had to do is believe. God was taking them to the promised land as the Lord God, the Lord God, your father, the God, listen, as the Lord God of your fathers have promised you in the land that flows with milk and honey. You're going into a place that you're never going to have to worry about it again. You're not going to have to cry out for good food. I just need you to pass through this desert. Just hold on a little longer. Don't move. And then he says, hero Israel, it's called the Shammah. The Lord your God is one. And thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk on the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand. And they shall be as frontlet between your eyes. You know what those frontlets are? Those little boxes that they, they put it's a leather box that they put on top of the forehead, just on top of the forehead, before the forehead, on top of the, the, the head. And they wrap it around with a leather belt because it represents the binding of God's word in the mind and in the heart. Oh, hallelujah. You shall bind them on your hand, he said, as a sign. And that little box also is next to the muscle, right of the, of the arm, right next to the heart, so that when you hold that leather belt that is wrapped around your hand, they say about nine times, and it's wrapped around your finger and you hold it, which represents the name of Yahweh. When you put it next to your heart and you have it upon your head as frontlets, you will keep the word of God girded in your mind and bind it in your heart as a sign. I want to say this very quickly, very important. That word sign, oath, is the same sign that God gave to Abraham when he said, circumcise yourself, for this shall be the sign. That's the same word. Cut the foreskin of your private off. Cut it off. Because in cutting it off, we're making a covenant. And this will be the covenant between me and you. And it shall be a sign to all the nations. Because this is the word monument. But I, let's go back just a little more. Go back to Genesis even a little more, and you see that when Cain killed his brother Abel, God says, you have to leave. And he said, I'll be a vagabond on the earth. They'll kill me. And God says, no one is going to hurt you because I'm going to put a mark on you. And God put a mark on his forehead, and he called it the sign, the oath. The same sign that Abraham had in his private place where he cut the foreskin the same sign that god told israel to put it as a sign upon your hand and it is the same sign in the new testament in the book of philippians when paul says for we are the true circumcision we who worship god the lord jesus in spirit this is what it means to be cut off from the world. The foreskin of our lives needs to be cut off by the knife of the spirit of the word of God so that we can live holy before him. 
God bless you. Have a wonderful, spirit-filled day. And remember, if you want to save yourself from the graves of lusts, you need to have the Word of God cutting you and bringing you to that place of total sanctification. Rest in Him. For the Bible tells us, Paul says, that godliness and contentment is great gain. God bless you.